Hey guys, can I have a review for The Exorcist Season 1, Episode 2, Chapter 2, Lupus in uh, Fabula, and I was definitely looking forward to this episode overall. I'm still trying to cope with the fact that the show is actually great, I mean, I can't really believe it, but... I was hoping that the first episode wasn't just a fluke. I was hoping that this episode would be really great, and I have to say that this was just as good, if not better, than the first episode. I really love this episode overall. I'm really loving where the show is going, and uh, just, they're really impressing me. I mean, I remember that everyone thought the show was going to be really shitty, and it really seems like everyone's starting to get on board with it, but let's just get right into it, because I'm really enjoying the show so far. There's a lot that happened in this episode, a lot to talk about, and uh, I'm really loving where the show is going. Right off the bat, we get this a very, very creepy scene. We see we're in this dark room, and there are these boys gathered in front of a priest, and he tells them they don't have a future and are basically nameless and don't really matter and warns them that he'll be testing them. So each boy is going to be sent to one at a time into a pitch black room with a possessed man, armed only with a Bible and cross. One boy doesn't retreat and remains in the room reading passages, and we don't know who this boy is, but overall just really creepy, and you can already tell what's going on there, but we fast forward to Father Marcus on the bus making notes in a well-worn Bible, and we get a lot more into Father Marcus in this episode, you know, Father Marcus is actually with uh, Father Tomas in this episode, and uh, that's one of the best parts here, but then we see using only light of her iPad, Angela goes to her kitchen for a midnight snack, the house is quiet around her when she suddenly hears this man's voice, and she's shocked finding only her daughter Casey, and this I really like because I was really worried, especially when we found out the twist last week that it was Casey that was possessed and not Kat. I was worried it was going to be this thing where Tomas would tell her that Casey's possessed and she wouldn't believe him. And no, she actually realizes it for herself that, oh shit, Casey's the one that's possessed. And she's seated in a chair. She's facing away from her in the room. She begins recording on her iPad, watching as her daughter feels up her own body. It's just really creepy overall. The voice had said that she was fresh and supple, and whoever's doing the voice is doing a really great job. It's honestly, I think, right up there with the voice from the original movie. It's very close to it, and Angela speaks to her daughter, and the male voice tells Casey her mother is snooping beside her and to wake up, and she jerks away, comes to her feet, all while Angela still records. Casey sees her mom, she looks very confused and frightened, and we basically get the sense that Casey doesn't really understand what's going on, she doesn't understand that she's possessed, and I thought that was a great way to start the episode. Then we get into the intro, which let me just tell you, the intro that I showed you guys, fucking love this intro, I mean, I really did like that short intro they did last week, but this intro is so damn good. There's something so uh, classy and just really creepy about it, and there's so many great images, just a lot of detail put in this, especially a network like Fox, who usually has very short intros. This intro is very detailed, it's actually quite long, and I really do love it overall. That intro in general, I really think is, a, is that enough is a reason for me to really recommend the show, because I really do love the intro, uh, but Either way, you know, you guys don't really care about that. I'm just saying that I really do love the intro, and I'm glad that they put the intro in here because as much as I liked what we got last week, I like this intro a lot more than the 30-second, you know, uh, little, you know, than the, like, two-second thing with the exorcist that we got last week. So Father Tomas speaks to Bishop Egan about Casey, saying he sat down with her after they're running in the attic. Casey didn't remember that her mom is concerned, and Casey's sister Kat and Father Henry are unaware of what's actually happening. Which, of course, we can see that Angela does know what's happening now, but Father Tomas received Angela's video of Casey, and now he wants to know if he can get approval for an exorcism. And Bishop Egan tells him that he's done an incredible job in the parish, and it hasn't gone unnoticed. And as we know, Tomas in general just doesn't really feel like this is his purpose. And we get more into that here, but His Holiness, he says, is visiting him in a week, in a month, and Tomas is on the welcoming committee, so it's a big month. The bishop says that this isn't his job and that the child just needs a psychiatrist and basically to just forget about the exorcism because it's clear that she's just crazy and that's not that. And Bishop Egan also brings up the fact that Father Marcus has gone missing and uh, we really, and obviously Tomas knows, you know, what's going on there. That Marcus, obviously, you know, he's gone off the grid and I really did like that. But Angela meets with her friend, Maria Walters, who was part of the group responsible for bringing the Pope to Chicago, and Pope Sebastian will be sleeping in a bedroll on the floor elsewhere, but Maria wants Angela's hotel to host his entourage, and security's critical, and uh, the meeting ends when Angela receives this message from Casey. She calls her cell phone, only hears heavy breathing, and obviously this freaks her out, and again, very creepy stuff going on here. We see Angela rushes home, she's yelling for her daughter, but there seems to be no answer, and we don't know really why she's not answering, but she calls 
calls her again, hears it ring in Casey's room, and it's there on her pillow, but Casey's not in the room, and this is the perfect example of how they should do a jump scare, because this actually was scary. Just then, Casey, Cat, and their dad come up the stairs. They went for ice cream, so someone was definitely on the phone breathing, and she picks up Casey's phone. There's a huge bug under it, and I'm talking like a huge bug. Cat is apparently the brave one of the group, snatches the pillow to find the bug. Under the pillow is a massive centipede, all swirling around with it in a circular group. Not even Cat's brave enough to deal with the insect invasion, and just really creepy stuff overall. And again, just really does show how great the show is handling the whole possession theme, and that in general really does make up for the bird hitting the window. There isn't any gags like that in this episode, and I think that's something the show is doing very well. It's not just a bunch of jump scares, it's actually telling a good story, and that's something that in general I'm very impressed with. So Tommaso turns home from a jog, and his apartment door is unlocked, and Marcus is in the kitchen after having picked the lock, and uh, Th Tomas doesn't know why he's there, obviously, because he just seems to randomly show up. Marcus wants to know if Thomas has told anyone else about the possessed girl, and Thomas admits that he told the bishop, and Marcus guessed that the bishop told him to bugger off, and he wants to know if Thomas always does what he's told, and Thomas is obviously very weirded out by this visit. I mean, something about it just really turns him off, and especially as Marcus keeps inspecting all of his possessions, and Tomas says that he doesn't know Marcus, but Marcus says that he knows Tomas. You know, he knows exactly what he's thinking, He's been in his position before, and I really do love the interaction between these two because we're really starting to see how similar they are, and Marcus believes the demon has gone possum and will gather strength before showing itself. He says he'll kill it when it does, and Tomas will either watch or pass out, and Marcus also asks about Jessica after seeing all the letters from her that Tomas keeps on his kitchen table, and just a lot of really great stuff in this scene with Marcus and Tomas and, uh, Definitely some of the best stuff in this episode are just those two. Alfonso Cayera and Ben Daniels are strong enough to carry an entire episode, and just their chemistry overall. I really am loving what we're seeing from them so far. So Casey's playing lacrosse with Kat looking on from the stands. She gets tripped. She goes down very hard right before they take a water break. She glances up at the stands and sees this man waving to her. And I don't know who the hell this guy is, but this guy is really fucking creepy. I mean, this guy... He goes beyond a pedophile. There's just something really off about it. It seems like he kind of knows what's going on with her, but he's seated next to her sister. The game starts up again, and the man is staring at her intently. Not just like a pedophile would, but like he actually has some sort of reason for staring at her and that he knows what's going on with her, which is interesting. And the game starts up again, and the same girl knocks her down again as the man stands up. Casey stares at her opponent, and when no one around her, the girl just breaks her leg, and she falls to the ground, leg contorted in a direction it wasn't intended to go, and Casey just smiles. So again, very creepy scene overall, and just little stuff like that. They're really getting down the fact that Casey's possessed, but she doesn't fully understand what's going on. She's happy that she won, obviously, but she doesn't really understand the entire story of what's going on. But I definitely feel like this man is connected to her possession. I just don't know what capacity yet. So, Marcus and Tomas are discussing what the demon will do. Jessica's name comes up once again as someone the demon can use to shame Tomas, and that's why she's there. That basically, you know, if you guys know how a demon works, you know, a demon will find your biggest fears and your biggest regrets and will try to torture you with them until it drives you crazy. And that's really what's going on with Tomas. You know, he has all these fears and they're really starting to drive him mad. And Marcus reads the letters. Tomas says he and Jessica helped each other with English and Spanish. She was married, and I like that we found out more about these two because we, we heard about Jessica, and I definitely knew there was more going on there, because he says that he and Jessica help each other with English and Spanish. She was married, he took his vows, and that's it. There's really nothing else to it, that there wasn't really an affair or anything going on there, and Marcus wants to know what else Tomas is hiding, because the demon will use everything against them, and he tells Tomas to break it off with Jessica for the sake of the Rand's family. If he cares about this family, he needs to break it off, because it's not doing them or him any good, and all it's going to do is further complicate things, and... Marcus seems like he really doesn't know what he's talking about here, and I really did like that. So, Henry, Cat, and Casey are then playing Jenga. They're discussing toilets and pipes, and Angela finally gets home from work. She joins Henry's team. Casey tells her about the lacrosse game and the girl whose leg snapped, and Cat warns Casey that the, uh, the mom will sick, uh, will, uh, sick father Tomas on her, and Henry doesn't understand. Cat says her mom told Tomas she was possessed by the devil, and Angela tells Henry that Cat hasn't seen the son in months, and Casey isn't herself, which is just 
Really strange overall, in case he pulls out a piece from the Jenga tower, a piece from the bottom that should have instantly made the tower fall, but for some reason it just doesn't, and again, that's very strange, and definitely part of what's going on with her, you know, being possessed, and Henry and Kat don't understand how it's possible the tower is still standing, but somehow it is, and again, they did a good job of not making the scene superficial, you know, this could have been a scene that was kind of cheesy or silly, but they did a good job of making it seem like it actually made sense. You know, she's possessed, and obviously there's this otherworldly being inside of Casey, and there are things she's doing that just aren't human, and we definitely see that. So, all while Angela and Casey are locked in a staring contest, Casey has a small smile on her face as the game ends, and uh, just really interesting stuff there. So Angela then visits Tomas at the church, says that the demon can now move things and it can hurt people, and she's really concerned, obviously, because if the demon can move a Jenga tower and keep it from moving, imagine what it can do with something actually serious, like a knife or a gun. I mean, it's, it's just terrifying to think about that someone like a demon, this demon clearly, you know, can levitate things, and it's crazy, and I mean, we've known this, you know, we've seen The Exorcist, but again, they're doing a good job of making this its own thing, so some of the stuff they're doing here, uh, because of the fact that there's, you know, technology, and things are different than they were in the 70s, really is working to their advantage, and I really do like that overall, but Tomas says that Bishop Egan wants Casey to see a therapist before they proceed, and Angela doesn't want Casey to see a therapist, but Tomas says they have to follow the church's rules, and really, that's out of his hands, he can't do anything about it, and after Tomas walks away, Angela begins to fill her water bottle with holy water, and this I thought was honestly very smart what she did here. She's interrupted by Father Marcus, who asks her if she knows how to use the water. He tells her to put it in Casey's drinking water, and it will be hard on the demon, because obviously one of the things a demon responds to the worst is holy water. You know, a demon obviously feels burned by it, and by getting Casey to drink the holy water, she's hoping it can avenge the demon. Now, yes, she doesn't fully understand the way the demon fully work, but we know that, in my opinion at least, it definitely seems like Angela's known something about this before, and it definitely seems like she already knows what she's doing when it comes to avenging this demon. So Angela takes her seat in the pew next to Henry while Casey and Cad help Father Tomas serve food to those in need. Casey serves Marcus and they introduce themselves to each other. He takes a seat in the pew and watches Casey and a man who looks homeless approaches her saying he knows her, he chose her, he wants to touch her and she jerks away. Just a very weird scene overall. Marcus goes to lead him out. He says the same words the possessed man said to the boy at the beginning of the episode and Marcus is stunned. So we're starting to get the sense that Marcus probably was that boy we saw in the beginning and that definitely makes sense. I mean, now we're starting to get more of the reason why Marcus went off the grid. There's obviously a reason why, and I think this definitely is connected to that. So Tomas then meets with Jessica, asking her for advice about Marcus. She took multiple buses to get there, and he says she knows him better than anyone. It's been 13 months and a week since they were together. He asks about after her husband, and she takes his hands. He pulls away, saying he can't do this, and it definitely seems like there's more going on there than just them teaching each other English. It's clear that there's an affair going on, and... She feels stupid and leaves, but not before telling him to send her another letter. She's clearly into this, and she doesn't really want to get out of it. But he knows that this demon is going to try to tempt him into going back there, and obviously he doesn't want to give in to the demon. So Marcus has followed the homeless man to the street. He watches as he gets into a delivery van, and after he leaves, Marcus looks through his tent. An elderly woman then tells him everyone knows him, calling him by name, saying they all feared him until he lost that little boy, and he orders the unclean spirit out. She stands asking in male voice on whose authority. She's not frightened, and the demon's not leaving her body. It's not working. Even after he placed the cross on her forehead, she says it's true what they say. She's not compelled and walks away, which is very strange how she's not affected. Now, I think I know why this is happening. I think it's mainly because Tomas, as we know, does not feel like an actual priest. And a lot of what he's doing are very unjust acts as a priest. You know, as a priest, you're not supposed to have sex. You're not supposed to fall in love. Those are all things that, as a priest, you're just not supposed to do. Because you're supposed to basically marry and devote yourself to the church. And, I mean, anyone knows that. But already, Tomas has committed these very, you know, uh, ghastly sort of evil type acts in the church and they're really starting to catch up and I think that's the reason why he's not as effective as someone like say Father Marcus who's a lot more experienced and basically she's not compelled walks away but not before placing her hand on his face and saying the mighty Marcus vessel of nothing and we don't really know 
what that means, but I thought that was a very interesting scene. So back at home, the Rand's family then sits down for dinner. Angela secretly poured holy water into Casey's glass, watching every move that Casey makes to the table, obviously because she knows the case. She knows she's on to Casey. I mean, she doesn't fully know she's possessed, but she's definitely on to her. And she apologized for being late for game night and being distracted. She also apologized to Kat for not knowing how to handle her pain and what she's been going through. And also the fact that she wrongfully accused her. I mean, she now knows that Casey is the one possessed and it's not Kat. And I do like that. I, I like uh, that you know, she's not thinking that it's still Cat because that would have gotten annoying, and I feel like in other, any other sh other shows would have done that, but this show clearly does not want to do that, and already I'm going to give it points for that, so Casey sips her water, nothing seems to happen at this point, and the family's acting pretty normal, they're clearing plates and talking, I mean, they seem like a normal family, but then Casey heads upstairs saying that she has studying to do, she races to the bathroom, throws up her entire dinner and the holy water, just really, really disgusting, but very reminiscent of The Exorcist, and we all remember the scene where she pukes out green goo, obviously they can't show that on this, because, you know, the network and time it is on and things like that, but I thought overall this was a very creepy scene, I, I really did love the way this was done, and uh, we see, basically, she's leaning over the toilet, she reaches into her mouth, pulls out the centipedes in one long continuous string again just really creepy and she's then sitting outside with a book by herself and there is that stranger from the stands of lacrosse game he approaches and she tells him she thinks that there's something really wrong with her and again i like that she doesn't really know what it is that's something that's very interesting i don't remember that happened in the exorcist i honestly can't remember i feel like it did but definitely Casey, she doesn't know that she's possessed, you know, she just knows that something weird's going on with her, and she's not used to it, and he says just a glorious seed breaching the soil, a fresh glimpse of the sun, that to me definitely seems like he knows what's going on, that he's in on this, but he sits next to her, asks her to tell him everything, she leans her head against his shoulder, and tells him what she thinks is going on, again, I just don't trust this guy, he seems very creepy, very off, and just something about him just does not seem right for her, and I definitely feel like he's not the right person for her to be talking to about this. So Tomas then looks through Marcus's tattered notebook. He's upset that Marcus's book has the blood of tortured children, and Marcus asks why Tomas thought the man of the church was hearing voices. Marcus explains it's because he recognized the demon in Casey, and we kind of get this long exposition scene with Marcus, but again, it's something that I actually want to know. Marcus believes that Casey isn't the only one possessed, and that there are many demons here, and Tomas wants him to leave, and instead, Marcus describes his horrific childhood, which clearly, I mean, it's, it's horrific, really. He was seven, his dad killed his mom in front of him, which that alone is hard, but after the murder, he was sent to a boy's home before being sold to the church, and at 12, he was, and basically, we get the sense that he was, in fact, um, part of, you know, the, the boys and everything, which kind of makes sense why they called them nameless, because they're orphans, and they just don't feel like they have a purpose, and at 12, he was locked in a room with a demon, he asked if Tomas was scared when he saw the demon in the attic, Tomas admits he was, Marcus said he felt relief, because at 12, he finally had a purpose, he was the gun, and the church was the hand, and the words were true, he saw God's face once, and it was so loud he couldn't hear it, now he says he's not fit, and Tomas should know that, and he swears in his life he can try to help, and uh, then it's Tomas's turn to admit things, you know, he says he's, and basically that he's going to help him, and now that he's opened up, Tomas opens up, says that he did see Jessica today, Marcus suggests they do this together, and they begin praying, and basically are going to help at each other, and I mean, there's a lot of things that we see that Marcus has gone through, and I really did like that overall, but you can tell there's a lot of stuff that both of these characters are going through, and I'm looking forward to seeing uh, if they're able to clean up the damage in their life. So throughout this entire episode, we keep seeing this young man on a bicycle. We don't know who he is, but there's like this rap music playing. He's got his, uh, you know, headphones in and... He's on a bicycle, this time he's returning home while wearing headphones and listening to music. He doesn't realize that his father's dead and his mother's being attacked in the other room, and she's killed. Then the murderer comes after the young man. He's also murdered, and the killers leave the murder scene with body parts. They join others, including the homeless man from the church. That definitely makes us think that, there's, that he knows what's going on. And in the street, each is carrying a small cooler, half a dozen or so, so these men get into the same white delivery van that picked up the homeless man earlier in the evening. Again, very weird. Marcus is still at Thomas, uh, Tomas's place when the news comes on, reporting the murders of nine people. Few details are given, but they were all brutal stabbings, and we don't know who those nine people are, and it's assumed that this is all gang-related. Now, we know it's not that. We know it's definitely not a gang. I'm thinking it's a cult of sorts who definitely are involved with this possession, but a lighted billboard then showing the post back with the words, he is coming, is showing the street. A very subtle way to show the darkness is about to come, and that is the way the episode ends. Really good stuff overall, but let's just get into this episode and my predictions for next week. 
So I, like I said, I'm still trying to get over the fact that the show is actually great. I just, I can't really, you know, I'm still like, holy shit, the show is actually great. Who would have known? But either way, I really did love this episode overall. And there's a lot of stuff to really talk about. First of all, I really like that already we're really getting into Marcus's character. His childhood seems to be very fucked up. And it seems like now he really is finding his true purpose. You know, he is meant to be a priest and he is meant to exercise these demons. And it seems like him, him exercising these demons are finally going to give him that that purpose in life and that he actually wants to do it on his own you know Tom even if Tomasi didn't want him to do it he would still do it anyway because he feels it's you know something that he needs to do and that it's his time to avenge the demon and I really did like that overall and his story just in general and it seems like this guy though has come back to haunt him and I don't really know what's going on there but clearly this demon seems to be going after Marcus and I really do like that overall uh, I don't know where exactly that's headed but clearly I mean we know that Marcus has been involved with demons pretty much all his life and I'm pretty sure that they're coming back after him but we'll have to see what happens with that Tomas as well, though, he has a lot of damage to clean up, in, you know, in terms of Jessica and what he's doing, which is very unholy and just not right for a priest to do. And the fact that they're going to help each other, I can't wait to see where that's going to go. I think that's going to be very interesting, uh, and I really do like where that's headed. I think, again, them helping each other out, that alone is enough for me to really enjoy, but... On top of that, you then have this whole thing going on with Casey, with her not knowing what's happening to her. I mean, clearly we know there's this unwor you know, unworldly being in her, and we don't really know what it is, but I really don't trust that homeless man. He clearly is involved with the cults. Uh, they're heavily involved with whatever's going on, and now there's murders happening, and I don't know if he's going to try to get Casey to commit a murder, but that's something we really didn't have in the original movie. And I really like that, actually. I don't recall hearing that there were tons of murders in the movie, and that kind of adds an aspect to the TV show. Because with a movie, you can do kind of a self-contained story, but with a TV show, you need to expand a bit, and I think having those murders are really going to add to what's going on. I think we're really going to see, you know, more of a cult movement and what's going on there, but I think that overall is very interesting. You know, who's behind these murders, and are those people the same people that are behind this possession? I'm going to say yes, because the guy on the bench who was with Casey very much seems like he knows what's going on with her and I really don't trust him overall and then we see next week he buys her this creepy dress of, this very revealing dress of sorts just really creepy overall but we'll have to see what's going on with that uh, I do like that Angela knows that Casey is possessed I think it's very interesting overall and uh I do like that story, and I like where they're going with Angela, with her knowing she can't really trust her daughter. I mean, it's a scary feeling, but she knows right now she can't trust her, and I did like that she did make amends with Kat. I like seeing that overall. Tomas and Jessica, this is going to be one of the most complicated plots of the show, but I do like where this is headed, because you can tell that Jessica and Tomas, you know, they truly do care about each other, and that this is a relationship he really doesn't want to put away, but unfortunately he has to if he wants to be a priest and he actually is serious about doing this he needs to get rid of some things that are unjust when you're a priest and again i think one of the reasons why he had no effect on that woman is because he just isn't inept you know he's not really do acting like a priest right now he doesn't feel like he's confident as a priest he doesn't feel like he's inept to do this and he feels like Marcus is someone who is a lot more apt to do this, and he's just not. And I'm looking forward to seeing where that's going to go, because again, to me, it seems like Tomas has a lot to deal with, and I really do like where that's headed. I think that's very interesting overall. And I think the story that Tomas told about Jessica isn't not true, but I definitely think there's more to it, and I'm sure we're going to get more into that, but we'll have to see what happens with that. That's going to be very interesting. Um, Casey not knowing what's going on with her, I don't really know how that's all going to turn out, but I think overall that's very interesting. Uh, what is the deal with the bugs, though? Because clearly uh, there's definitely some connection to these bugs. We don't really know, but we'll have to see what's going on with that. I think that's going to be very interesting overall. And... Again, I like that so far, this seems to be less of a show about possession and more of a show about the characters and their inner demons and really them trying to conquer these demons and things like that. There definitely are a lot of outcast vibes from the show. I'm not saying the show's as good as outcast, definitely not saying that, but I'm real up what I'm getting with the show so far. Honestly, guys, if they keep this up, I'm surprised. I'm gonna. I'm shocked to say this, but I think we found the new Hannibal. I really think we have. I mean, this show has the great cast that that show had. This show has the great dialogue the show had. That show. This show has the great cinematography that show had. Really, the show I think could end up as good as Hannibal was. And Hannibal wasn't gr was great in its first season, but it got better and better as it went on. And I feel like The Exorcist could be exactly the same way. This is gonna be like a Hannibal or a Bates Motel, where it's one of those horror series that we didn't think could work as a TV show and so far is working out pretty damn well as a tv show i'm real loving the show so far 
But either way, guys, let me know what you guys thought of this episode. Love your thoughts on it. Are you enjoying the show as much as I am? I'm happy to see that a lot of people are watching it because I really do want the show to go far. I know it's only 13 episodes, and that's something that Hannibal benefited from very well, is that they only had 13 episodes to tell the story, and I'm hoping that this isn't one of those shows that gets picked up for a full season because I feel like they'll benefit a lot more from a 13 as opposed to like 22. I think it's going to work a lot better that way. But anyway, guys, in my review, hope you guys enjoy it. We'll see you guys in my next, which will be for Quarry. I have two episodes to review of that, and I will see you guys for that. Okay, bye.